welcome everyone at our Zoom Hearing Colosseum. Uh, our speaker today is uh, Oliver Brunsmith. Uh, so let me maybe say a few words about uh, him before he starts speaking about uh, uh, science. So he did his uh, master's uh, uh, in both physics and mathematics uh, uh, at the Bristol University. And then uh, his PhD in York under the supervision of uh, Professor Paul Bush. Uh, he was mostly interested uh, in uh, mm, theory of quantum measurement in his PhD. Uh, and then after this, he moved to Poland, to Krakow. He spent three years, uh, almost three years, I think, uh, uh, in the group of Kamil Kozekpa uh, at the Jagiellonian University. And then uh, in October 2023, so less than one year ago, he moved to Warsaw and he is a member of my group. So uh, he's currently working uh, uh, in, uh, his work is uh, devoted to theory of the designs and some nice connections with the heat equation on compact lead groups. Uh, and today, actually, he will not speak about this because it is, it is still, this is still some work in progress. And he will speak about his previous work on classical simulation of quantum circuits. Only the floor is yours. Yeah, uh, thank you, Adam. Uh, yeah, so, um, yes, this is my previous work, and also there's some ongoing work that I'm doing on this subject as well. So this is not a completely previous work. Um, but yeah, the the core of this talk is uh, essentially these three papers, which were all put on archive on the same day last summer, uh, not coincidentally. Uh, so I'm the author of this bottom one, uh, that we have and Kamil. Um, so I'm mostly going to talk about what we did, um, but the, I will talk about what the other guys did as well. Um, so the the kind of the main point is uh, we and Beatrice Dierks and Robert Koenig did almost the same stuff in our papers. Um, that basically these two are equivalent. And then this work by Josh Pepe and Sergey Strachuk in uh, Cambridge. Um, they did something slightly different, but closely related to what we did. So these two are basically the same, and this one is related. Uh, and I will talk about these about later. Uh, good. So um, before we start, I'm going to try and provide some motivation so that you're at least vaguely interested in what I'm going to say. Uh, so the first motivation I have is some kind of practical problem. If you give me a quantum circuit, I want to know what the best way is to classically simulate it. Um, and I want to do this essentially because I have a very good classical computer on my desk in my office, and I don't have a universal quantum computer. And in fact, I don't even have access. There isn't one in the world, unless you work for like the NSA or someone, maybe they have one. But in general, if you want to do classical computations, you have to, sorry, if you want to do quantum computations, you have to classically simulate them because there just isn't a virtual quantum computer anywhere in the world. Um, and so, I, I, yeah, I want to understand how best to do this. And I also have some kind of foundational theoretical motivation, which is I'm kind of interested in this question about what, if anything, separates quantum computers from classical computers. What is like the special source, the special ingredient that makes a quantum computation different to a classical one? And the approach to understanding this is to say, um, you know, we can understand essentially the class of computations, which we can simulate classically efficiently, we can kind of gain some, some theoretical understanding of those. And we can kind of understand that um, the quantum ones, the interesting ones, are the ones that we cannot classically simulate, right? Because if you can classically simulate it, it's not very quantum. Um, and so this is kind of the foundational motivation of this work, is trying to understand this gap between classical and, classical and quantum computational power um, and where it comes from. So good. And this is kind of the picture I'd like to draw. This is pictures appeared on essentially the slides of every talk we've given for the last few years. Um, the idea is we have some incredibly complicated high dimensional landscape of quantum computations or computation in general. And um, we want to kind of map it, right? We want to understand which are the computations which are really high and hard to get to, and which are the computations that lie in some valley which you can easily simulate. Uh, we want to kind of some, gain some understanding of this landscape. Um, I think we are gaining some understanding of the valleys in this landscape as we, as we go on. We're gaining understanding of the easy bits. I think we don't really have any understanding of the, the peaks in the landscape at all at this point, but whatever, we, we, we're trying. Um, okay, before we start getting this properly, I want to make a note on complexity theory. Um, so here are some known inclusions. So P is an NP, some of you may have heard about this P versus NP problem. Uh, and these things are all inside the thing to the right, right? So NP is an MA and QMA and blah, 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 blah. Uh, I've highlighted these two, QMA and DQP. These are kind of the quantumly relevant ones. So if you know what P and NP are, at least vaguely, QMA is sort of the quantum equivalent of NP, and BQP is sort of the quantum equivalent of P. Uh, so these are kind of complexity paths relevant for us today. Um, unfortunately, we don't really know anything about classical complexity theory. So I give you all these inclusions, 
But actually, this prep question of is P equal to P space is un unknown. It's wildly open. No one has any idea how to solve this question. So it could, in fact, be that P equals P space and these guys are all the same. Um, for this talk, I'm going to assume that that doesn't happen, just because it's really hard to talk about this stuff if all of these guys could be the same. Right? Space Pardon? P space, space is the computations you can do on the universal Turing machine in polynomial space. So maybe it takes exponential time, but you're, you're space banded to polynomial space. Right, so it's a, this is a very big complexity class. It's huge, um, but it is potentially the same as P. Uh, we don't know. Uh, so, so yeah, so okay, these could be the same, but for now, I'm going to pretend that they're not the same. I'm just going to pretend that these inclusions are strict and it's actually meaningful to talk about compu quantum computational power as being different to classical computational power, just because it makes things easier to, to say. Okay, so I know there are a bunch of non quantum computing experts in the field. So here is a, a quick quantum computing 101. You build a quantum computer out of qubits. The state of a quantum, the state of a qubit is essentially defined by two complex numbers, so amplitudes. And if I have two quantum systems, I stick them together. The state of the combined system is given by the tensor product. Okay. And the practical upshot of this is if you have an n qubit machine, an n qubit quantum computer, um, then this is given by a complex vector of dimension two to the n, uh, a list of just two to the n complex numbers. Um, obviously, you can build a quantum computer out of qubits or whatever else you like, but okay, for now, qubits, they're just as. Um, yeah, and we use this plane notation that looks like this. So this is just a vector of that lives in the complex vector space of two to the n dimension. Um, quantum gates are just things that update states, and essentially for physical reasons, you can they have to act linearly and they have to be unitary, or technically they could be anti-unitary, but anyway, they have to be unitary. Um, and so a gate is just a two to the n by two to the n dimensional complex matrix, which is unitary, it has this property, uh, and it updates states by vector multiplication. So the the matrix multiplies the vector and you update it, whatever. Uh, the final ingredient of quantum computing 101 is measurements. So this is, as Adam mentioned briefly, I, I did my PhD in quantum measurement theory. So this is a very, very, uh, let's see, uh, high level, not entirely true um, approach to quantum measurement theory I have on this slide. But okay, just for computational basis measurements, um, I put an X inside this plane notation to, um, for the vector which has a single one in the X coordinate. So maybe it has X is five and it has a single one in the fifth coordinate and all the other coordinates are zero. So this guy's computational basis vector. And computational basis measurements work like this. You get an outcome X with probability given by this funny formula, which is the one rule. Okay. For the astronomers, I hope at least vaguely this helps. Uh, this is quantum computing 101. Okay. What is a quantum computer? So I, I, I want to compare classical and quantum computational power in this talk. Uh, and it's hopefully, uh, at some point I would like to do this. It, it's quite hard. Um, so for me, a, classical, a quantum computer is something which takes classical inputs and gives classical outputs. It's not something which you stick quantum information in and you get quantum information out. You give in classical data and you get out classical data. And um, this essentially is the only meaningful definition that you can have for a computer here because you can't compare a quantum machine that has like quantum output. Put inputs to a classical machine. You, you kind of have to have classical inputs and outputs. Um, so that's what a quantum computer um, is, this talk. And yeah, what is simulation? So in addition to quantum computers, I have the word simulation on my title. So simulation um, can be thought of in a bunch of different ways. So these are all from this paper by Richard Josser and Martin Bunkness. Um, and there's sort of different ways of approaching this probability distribution that I showed you a couple of slides ago, this born probability distribution. You can essentially either draw samples from the Voronoi distribution. So every time you run your simulation algorithm, you get a sample, like an X from this distribution, or you can directly compute probabilities. And these are called strong and simulation. Um, and yeah, you can also do these with exact or uh, exactly uh, approximately, and your approximation, it makes sense to consider either relative or absolute error. Mm -hmm. For this talk, uh, what we did essentially was we did strong approximation to Voronoi probabilities uh, in absolute error. And the reason we did this essentially is because um, we know how to do strong uh, simulation, approximately. And doing this, solving this problem with relative error instead of absolute error is really hard. It's um, sharply hard if you know the complexity classes. Um, for those who don't know the complexity classes, this is a problem which would be very difficult even if you have access to a universal fault on a quantum computer doing this with relative error. Um, so essentially, it, it doesn't make sense to do this with relative error. Um, it's, it, it would be hard even if you had a perfect quantum computer to do that. So let's do this with absolute error. And along the way, it turns out that we also came up with a way of doing weak simulation to absolute error as well. But our focus was this, and we kind of got that from break. Um, cool. So, uh, 
now I can kind of introduce the main like tool that I use to think about these things, which are this, these objects I call computational resource theories. Um, and these are just a bunch of quantum states, a bunch of gates, and a bunch of measurements you can do. And essentially, the key point is that the or the first key point is that the operations map your set of free states to your set of free states. So I have some free states, and if I do as a free operation on a free state, I get something that's still a free state. So we kind of preserve this um, free state space. And the reason the word computational is in this thing and not just resource theory is that um, kind of the key point is that you can simulate this setup efficiently in classical polynomial time. So I, I wrote a set of questions here, but really what I mean is that you can efficiently classically compute anything you like about this setup. Um, yeah, so this is a computational resource theory. Um, and I'll give you some examples. So I think a decent chunk of the audience here has already written papers about the Clifford stabilizer sub, sub theory of quantum mechanics. Uh, it's very widely used in quantum information and quantum computing. Um, so here, the setup is you have these parity operators I wrote on the right-hand side. Um, so they're just strings of these parity matrices on each qubit. And the Clifford gates are the unitaries which map strings of parties to strings of parties. So these are free operations, free, free unitaries. The free states are stabilizer states, which are simultaneous eigenvectors with eigenvalue one of uh, a group of parity operators that commutes an abelian group of parity operators. And the free observables are just computational based observables. And it's been known for about 25 years that if you set things up like this, um, you can classically simulate everything in polynomial time. And this came as quite a big surprise to people in 1998. And um, the reason is that already back in the 90s, people were thinking about this question about what separates classical from quantum computational powers, power. And one of the guesses, one of the things we thought was it might be entanglement. Classical computers don't have entanglement, quantum beats have entanglement. Maybe entanglement is a special thing that separates quantum from classical computation. And um, this sub theory kind of uh, works a counterexample to that theory, to that idea, um, because this setup, in this setup, you have states with unbounded entanglement. Um, so this idea that entanglement is the thing which separates classical from quantum is just wrong. Um, because here you have unbounded entanglement and you can still simulate it. Right. Um, Although I will say that the entanglement in the Clifford stabilized sub theory is quite specific. It's quite limited. Mm -hmm. It's quite, uh, you can have large amounts of entanglement, but in very specific ways. So maybe there's still something there. Yeah. Um, okay, my second example is the resource theory of coherence. Um, and here your free states are actually just computational basis states. So these are the guys, the free states are literally just the guys which have a single one in them somewhere, and the whole rest of the basis vector is zero, right? Uh, and the three unitary operations are just permutations. They just bounce this, bounce this one around to different places. And the free observables are just computational basis observables. And if you, you sit down and, and you think about these incoherent um, states and, and uh, operations like this for a little bit, um, you very quickly realize this, is, this setup is exactly the same as um, the logic of classical reversible logic circuits. So they're just classical circuits with like or and not, or zor and not and so on. Um, so yeah, this is a kind of trivially classically simulable because it is just a classical computation. Uh, and the last example I want to give is actually entanglement. So I mentioned entanglement is not the only thing uh, a while ago, but entanglement is a thing that you need in a quantum computation. Um, and so this is the sketch. So imagine I have a quantum computation with uh, nine qubits here, so each of these lines is a qubit, um, but it's separated into three blocks. So within this block uh, at the top, um, anything can happen in the top block, but the top block doesn't talk to the second block, and the second block doesn't talk to the third block, and so on. Um, so this is efficiently classically simulable um, in a number of blocks. You just you can just you can just simulate each block kind of separately. Um, and so if these blocks could talk to each other uh, or interact with each other, then this simu then simulating the setup would take order of two to the n k time, so two to the kind of nine here. Um, but since they're kind of separated into blocks like this, there's no entanglement between the blocks. You can simulate this in uh, time k times two to the n. So it's sort of efficient in k, but not in n. Okay. And then here is a slide where I just threw all the examples which I managed to cook up. So there's a whole bunch of examples. The, the ones I have on the, I've seen so far are the first three examples on this slide. Um, you can see in my sort of, uh, my sections coming up, there is something about fermion periodics. So uh, this guy we're going now. Uh, log space quantum circuits are just arbitrary quantum circuits, except you have a logarithmic number of qubits. And you know, it's, it's kind of obvious that you can simulate a quantum circuit in time two to the n. So if n is logarithmic in something, then two to the n is polynomial. <laughs> Because two to the log is yeah polynomial, and you can probably you, you can cook up examples based on contextuality and uh, Wigner positivity, Wigner functions, and so on. Um, there are lots of examples you could. I, I spoke to Richard Joseph from Cambridge about this, and he thinks that you can make something involving post-selection as well. 
Um, but I didn't understand it, so I didn't put it on the slide. But okay, there are there are lots of examples of these uh, computational resource theories that uh, you can cook up. Um, so I, I, I've now spoken quite a lot about these things. I haven't really said why you should care about them at all. Um, these computational resource theories, and maybe you don't. So I'm trying to persuade. Now I'll try and persuade you that you should a little bit. Um, oh yeah, I didn't say uh, these two examples are the same. There's a paper from like 15 years ago that proves these two are actually computational equivalent. Whatever. Um, so yeah, why should you care about these things? Um, and the answer is that they form base camps in this landscape of quantum computation, which I, I showed you before. So not only uh, is a, a computational resource theory itself easy to simulate, but it makes nearby stuff easy to simulate. So not only is it relatively easy to get to Everest Base Camp, but the existence of Everest Base Camp makes it relatively easy to get up Everest compared to how it would be if there wasn't a base camp there, right? So the existence of the computational resource theory makes it possible to simulate stuff which is interesting and nearby, as well as just itself, right? And this is why you should care about them, um, because they, they give you simulation algorithms for stuff which is also not in the resource theory itself, but, but close by. Uh, and I'm gonna talk to you in this section, you know, some mention about how that, how that works. Um, the first step is kind of, I was kind of two minds whether I want to put this slide or not, but the first step is um, you can generically replace uh, non-free, so gates which are not, sorry, sorry I say free, is uh, when I say free, I mean something that's in the resource theory, and when I say not free, I mean outside, sorry, I didn't define that. Um, so you can generically replace a non-free gate um, by a free gate and some input magic state. Um, so this is the equation here. Um, says essentially a not free T gate in the, the Clifford T um, sub theory is equivalent to uh, a C naught, which is free, an S, which is free, a measurement, which is free, a computational basis measurement, which is free, and this not free T gate, T state, okay? So I take the, the not free stuff in the gates and I replace it with the not free stuff in states. Um, and this kind of works pretty generically. Uh, so essentially, we, without loss of much generality, we just care about not free states and we forget about not free operations. Um, this turns out actually be useful in practical quantum, in like physical quantum computers as well, in error correction, but anyway, we, we'll, we'll move on. Um, so now how do we deal with not free states? And the answer is really stupid. Uh, what you do is you write a not free state as a sum of a bunch, a superposition of a bunch of free states. And then you just evolve all the free states. Uh, yes. I have a question to the previous one. Sure. Uh, does like this magic uh, state and the non-free state, non-free gate correspond them? Is it like constructive or is it only proof that there exists? So if I give you a non-free gate, do you immediately know what is the state or? Uh, immediately no. But what happens in practice is you work with some gate set. So you will fix like a gate set of Clifford gates plus say single qubit rotations. And then you can easily gadgetize the single qubit rotations. But I think, um, let's say, uh, if the not free gate is like bounded in size, like it's not uh, an n an n qubits a thing, but it's like some fixed qubit number of qubits, then you can do it constructively. It's not that difficult. But if you want to do it for like a generic unitary, no, there's no hope because it just it's too big and complicated. Uh, yeah. But you kind of have to work over some gate sets, so this isn't really a problem. Um, okay. So yeah, so yeah, well, as I was saying, you just write your things as sum of free states, evolve them, evolve, evolve the free states using free operations, because we replace all the operations now with free operations. Um, and the simulation cost goes essentially as the number of free states in this decomposition that you need. Um, a very slightly more complicated thing you can do is not do this exactly, but do this with some error. So uh, you, you decompose a state which is very close in say two norm, whatever norm you like, to your target state. Um, and then the simulation cost goes with this approximate rank. Um, so this idea was worked out some almost uh, five or 10 years ago now, uh, mostly by papers with Slavia Rabi on them uh, and his collaborators. Um, and it, it, it's, it is essentially, it's the right thing to do. This is, this is what you should do in, the, in an ideal world. But unfortunately it's very hard to come up with these rank decompositions. Uh, one of the reasons that it doesn't work so well or it's very hard is that if I have an epsilon approximate decomposition here, um, say epsilon is 0.1 or 0.01 or whatever, I can't easily get um, an epsilon approximate decomposition with a different epsilon. If you come, if the experimentist comes to me and says, ah, she I need epsilon to be like a tenth of that or something, I can't actually do that easily. Or um, you can't also, you would sort of naively expect that you would be able to move to a decomposition with a large epsilon and it would make things cheaper. And there's not really a generic way of doing that either. Um, 
So I'm going to talk to you about is something that's a bit more flexible than this. You essentially vary this epsilon, this error, uh, more or less freely. And these simulation algorithms that are based on this quantity called the extent. And this is a slightly bizarre quantity. I, ex I expect some people to be surprised by this quantity. Um, so this is the lowest possible one norm squared of a vector alpha, such as the decomposition of your state um, in terms of free states and uh, the coefficients from this vector alpha. So why on earth would you care about the lowest one norm squared? Uh, I hope to explain this to you now. Um, yeah, so how this goes is you, you start with a decomposition like this. This is exactly the same as I showed you before. And you make this trivial rearrangement. You divide here by the one norm of alpha. You stick that one, you multiply again by the one norm of alpha. Uh, so this f got longer by an amount of one norm of alpha. Uh, and I made this into an absolute value and I put the phase here. Um, so this is a completely trivial rearrangement. Um, we divided and multiplied by the same thing and we, took, we put the phase out here. Um, and the important points are two things. This f now is longer by a factor of one norm alpha. And also this thing is probably a distribution because it's, you know, it's some coefficients divided by the one norm of the coefficients. It's trivially uh, a probability distribution. Um, and what our simulation algorithm is going to do is it's going to sample from this probability distribution and it's going to use some concentration equalities like Hofting's equality to bound how far away the sample mean is going to be from the true expected value, which is the target state. Um, so yeah, it's a trivial arrangement to make a probability distribution here. Um, okay. So, uh, okay, yeah, this is exactly what I just said. Uh, concentration equalities say that with high probability, the sample mean is close to the true mean. Uh, good. So now I'm going to try and show you where the uh, extent comes from, this one norm squared comes from. So the first thing is to say, okay, in the in the kind of um, requirements of this theorem of Zama, uh, here we require that the two norm squared of our vectors uh, is less than m. Okay, and if you remember on the previous slide, we multiplied all of our vectors by the one norm of alpha. So okay, so the m essentially is m gets blown up by the one norm of alpha squared. And then here in the right hand side of this inequality, um, which is just talking this inequality, what we have is the number of samples divided by m. So this probability, this failure probability is small exactly when the number of samples is large enough to dominate m. And m has the one norm of alpha squared in it. So essentially the number of samples you take has to be big enough to dominate um, the, the one norm of alpha squared. And this is why you would ever care about the extent um, exactly because of this inequality. Um, Good, hopefully that makes sense. <laughs> Essentially, we care about the extent because of Hopkins inequality. Um, and it, it, the extent tells us how many samples we have to take in this sampling regime. Okay, good. Uh, so yeah, what did we do? Uh, me, Kamal, and Michal. Um, we cooked up a simulation algorithm that works for universal quantum circuits. Uh, I should say the universal quantum circuits, which are written as, um, written in terms of a gate set, which is an arbitrary fermionic hydroxyl unit tree. Um, and some non FLO gates, which I'll define later. Uh, and the point of our rhythm is that it's polynomial in everything, except that the runtime depends linearly on the extent. So when you expect to have an exponential runtime for a quantum simulation algorithm, the exponential runtime is entirely because the extent is exponentially large. Um, everything else is polynomial. So in some sense, um, for this algorithm, for this setup, the extent is telling you how not classical your computation is. Your computation is a polynomial thing, a classical computation, a classical polynomial computation multiplied by the extent. <coughs> uh, good. So uh, now I'm going to talk to you a little bit about fermion optics. There are some experts in the audience uh, who know probably more about this than I do. Um, so fermion optics, you can define in terms of these um, creation and annihilation operators. I should say, so there are some also some what I would call real physicists in the audience. So I wouldn't get too excited. These are, these are not very physical fermions, okay? This fermionic optical setup, um, essentially it models the behavior of um, spinless fermions who have a, a finite number of sites they can hop to. So it's not bad physically, the, the spinless fermions. But anyway, uh, this is fermionic optics. Um, so we define everything essentially in terms of these creation and operators. There are n of each of them. And it turns out to be convenient to write it in terms of Majorana fermion operators, um, just because this um, Equation 12, this anti-commutation relation is convenient. It's, it's easy to work with. Um, and then, yeah, so um, if you're a quantum information person like me, you can explicitly use the Jordan-Bigner transformation and embed this uh, FLO fermionic system in a system of qubits. 
And then these my runner operators um, just turn to strings of puzzles, which is quite nice and easy to work with for, for quantum people. Um, yeah, good. And then we say a, a unit tree, an operation is fabulous, it's free, it lives in the sub theory. If uh, when you stick one of these my, take one of these my runner operators and stick the unit tree on either side of it like this, what you get is the sum of my runner operators. So it maps my runner operators into sums of my runner operators. And people who have done work with the Clifford unit trees might they think this is familiar um, because a Clifford unit tree essentially is Clifford if it's um, when you take a power like this, it multiplies you to a product of power these. Uh, the Myra, the FLO guys take a, a guy and map it to a sum instead of a product. Okay. It, it's it's sort of very similar. Uh, and yeah, equation I just define this map phi. So phi takes u to this r. Um, and okay, the reason that this would be useful for classical simulation, the reason I'd be interested in this, or the reason I would be interested in this, is because to start with, this unit tree u is a two to the n by two to the n dimensional complex matrix. So it's really big, two to the n is big. Um, whereas this matrix r is actually just two n by two n, which is quite small. Um, so classically, my classical computer has no hope of dealing with u a priori, it's two to the n dimensional. Um, whereas my classical computer can very easily deal with r, it's, it's polynomial. Um, so this is kind of the where you might get interested in classical computation here. Um, and there's a nice theorem by Toho and Dimitrenzo more than 20 years ago now, uh, which says that if you have FLO circuits um, as computational basis states, you can classically simulate this ever. Um, yeah, I should say this is not obvious um, just from this like thing I told you about dimensions here, because in particular, if you talk about bosonic linear optics, bosonic linear optics has the same thing here with the the R matrix and it being low dimensional, but for side matrix, you cannot compute these probabilities sufficiently. So it, it's it's a little bit more than that, but okay. You can compute these uh, probabilities explicitly and you can also sample, you can do everything you want, um, classically, efficiently. Okay, halfway through. Okay, then there's a nice theorem, uh, which has been proved by a few people. It's kind of implicitly in this reference 11 and it's very explicitly in this reference 10, um, which basically says that if you have FLO, so these three, these three operations I just defined, uh, which map my runner fermions to my runner fermions, and you add extra states that look like this, um, then you end up with a setup which is universal for quantum computation. Um, and this is very nice um, for someone like me that wants to simulate universal quantum circuits, because essentially um, it moves all of the difficulty of simulation into understanding these magic states, right? Um, I already understand very well how to deal with the FLO bit, the, um, the, the, the free unit trees, and all I need is additional magic states like this. I have to understand these guys. Um, cool. So then there's a, a lemma. It's kind of obvious that uh, if you take this state on the previous slide, you can write it as a sum of two free states. So it, it is a sum of two FLO states, uh, which is very nice. Um, yeah, this is, I mean, it's not even really worth calling this lemma. It's literally just an orthogonal composition. Um, it is quite surprising this is an orthogonal composition. So, um, we're doing this FLO, this, this sort of same game was played for Clifford stabilized sub theory about five or six years ago. And there, when you do this, you end up in a decomposition like this, except that um, in a technical sense, the optimal decomposition for Clifford stabilized sub theory is as far away from being an orthogonal decomposition as you can get. In this case, it's an orthogonal decomposition. I don't know why. Um, but okay, it is. And then, yeah, theorem says um, the decomposition on the previous slide is actually the extent optimal one. So it is the best one according to this, this measure of the extent. Um, further, um, yeah, if I take um, a, pro a tensor product of two magic states, then the extent is just the product of the extents. So I proved this, and also Diaz and Koenig independently in Germany proved that. And then a more interesting theorem from the guys in Cambridge says that if you have a tensor product of an arbitrary number of these states, that's equal, the extent of this thing is equal to the product of the individual extents. And I should say, these are properties that are true, for even for qubit states, I would not expect these to be true for any other states, for most other states. These are, these are very special. Um, there is an asterisk here. Um, so when I say the guys in Cambridge proved it, uh, they proved it twice so far. Their first, their first proof had a minor mistake in it, uh, and their second proof also mm -hmm. has a mistake in it. Um, so it remains to be seen if their second proof can be fixed. Uh, and I've independently proven this as well. And I think my proof doesn't have a mistake. But anyway, this result, um, I'm pretty sure it's true, but uh, the published proofs of this actually do contain errors. So yeah, it has an asterisk. 
Uh, fine. Uh, so where do these results come from? They come from scale representation theory. They actually come from some work by um, Professor Kush, uh, Marek, and Mihao a few years ago. Um, so if you want to ask about representation theory, you can ask <laughs> Professor Kush and not me. Uh, I do vaguely understand this, but very roughly what happens is um, for a four qubit system, um, well, okay, first, terminal theory optics respects the parity operator, essentially. So it will, if you start in the even parity subspace, it will stay in the even parity subspace. So on the left-hand side of this equation, what you have is the, the dimension of a four fermion or a four qubit system uh, is two to the four, divided by two is eight, and you divide by two because you stay in one parity subspace. Um, whereas uh, the two n by two n uh, real orthogonal matrices I mentioned before are eight dimensional because n is four. Uh, so both of these guys are eight, essentially. So it just so happens specifically for n is four that the left and right hand side of this equation are the same. Uh, it doesn't work in any other dimension. And this gives you um, a super nice action of how fermion theory optics acts in, um, on, four, on these kind of four qubit systems. Uh, so this uh, is very explicitly in this paper by Marek and uh, Mihaj Manjets. And uh, it's good. Uh, yeah, and this essentially lets us prove results about these four dimension systems that we can't prove in any other dimension. Uh, so this is why we can do this. Uh, great. Uh, so yeah, how does our, um, so I, I told you that we care about the extent for doing simulation. Um, I told you that we came up with a simulation algorithm. So I should tell you exactly or roughly what our simulation algorithm does. Uh, that's kind of different from, from, from what we added. Um, so the problem that we had is, if you remember, many slides ago at this point, we are trying to add up state vectors of free states to get something which is equal to our target not free state. And if you're going to, if you're going to add up state vectors, you have to know what the phases of them, right? If one of them's got a minus sign on it and you don't know about it, then you have to subtract it instead of add it, right? Or if it's got an into the i phi for a random phi, you, you have to know about it. Um, but the efficient simulation algorithms of thermodynamic optics are based on this, this adjoint action, the sticking of u and u dagger on either side of your C. Mm -hmm. And if you can kind of very easily see in this equation, if I multiply u by some phase, u dagger will get the opposite phase and it'll cancel out. And so I kind of lose all the phase information in this equation. Um, it turns out that the phase information is slightly, okay. Yes, you do lose all the phase information in this equation. Um, it turns out that this is not arbitrary phases, but essentially you lose minus signs in this equation, but, but whatever. Um, so yeah, the, the contribution, the key contribution of our paper, in addition to these uh, lemmas about how the extent works, is um, a way of keeping track of these phases. That's all we do, uh, is we keep track of these phases and then we kind of plug into known results that give you uh, universal simulation algorithms. Uh, so how do we do this? Oh, sorry, I, I, I wrote a little sketch mm -hmm. about how this problem goes. So let's say we have this, this FLO unit tree U and we want to multiply it by another FLO unit tree. Uh, we want to do this efficiently. So we want to do this multiplication in the orthogonal group because this is polynomial sized or has polynomial dimension, whereas the explicit like unitary matrices are exponentially large. So we do it, we take our U, we map it into the orthogonal group, which is now uh, lowercase u is polynomial sized. We do the multiplication in the unitary group, but now we don't know how to invert this map, this phi here, because there are multiple guys which, uh, with different, which differ by phases. Uh, and so we want to recover these phases. You said that there are only two and they differ by sign. Why is it so? Um, okay, because FLO is a FLO is essentially the same as spin to n, and spin is a double cover of uh, special okay. group, so it's okay. it's a two. Okay. Yeah. Uh, so a priori you could use arbitrary phases, but it turns out there's just minus signs. Yeah. Um, because of this double cover thing. I had a slide about that, but I removed it. Um, <laughs> uh, I should have kept it. But yeah. And that's why there are two dotted lines here, because it's a double cover. Um, yeah. Okay, so how do we do this? Uh, the idea is really simple. If you have an FLO unit tree who, which has uh, the vacuum state, the all zero vector as an eigenvector, um, this is very easy to keep track of the phase of, because you can just take in a product like this and recover the phase. Um, if this was not an eigenvector, um, like this, then computing in a product like this could a priori give you zero, or they could give you, um, or they will actually generically give you exponentially small uh, answers, which a classical computer will then kind of lose precision in. Like if you take computers in a product on a classical computer and it's two to the minus 50, then your classical computer will just give you numerical noise. Essentially. So uh, it's very important, or it's very easy to keep track of guys who have zero vector and essentially impossible otherwise. 
Um, and there's this decomposition that gets called Cartan decomposition or the KAK <coughs> decomposition. Uh, it's called KAK because you have a K here, a K here, and this thing in the middle is A. Um, which lets you take an arbitrary FO unitary and write it in terms of a K, which you can keep track of the phases of, K2, which you can keep track of the phases of, and this middle bit, uh, which only has this sort of linear number of lambdas in, and which you can also keep track of the phases of. Um, so this is kind of the trick that we do. We, we use this cut into composition. And um, yeah, this gives you a nice representation for arbitrary FLO states, which is efficient and lets you keep track of phases. Um, so this is an arbitrary FLO state written in this form. K is one of these guys has zero as an eigenvector. Mm -hmm. This product is essentially just set of, yeah. So this K are from neutral groups because it is K, A, A, the composition. Yep. It has some special subgroup, yes, and the. Yep. So this K group. is a subgroup which has zero as an eigenvector. And that's all. Uh, it turns out that, so if you take that as a sort of starting point, it turns out that what they do is they preserve uh, number subspaces. So they, they're passive effort unitaries. They map like, okay. Okay. yeah. But if you start with saying they have zero as an eigenvector, then you get that as a sort of uh, result. Yeah. This, uh, this has two yeah, yeah. They, so they they, um, they preserve number subspaces. Okay. They, they don't change number the permanence. Yeah, exactly. Change the number. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, so these Ks preserve number of permanence, essentially. And these A's here, uh, we were written most recently here, just set up superpositions with different numbers of fermions. Um, yeah, these are creation operators, so yeah. Uh, so this is quite nice. Um, and if you stick all this stuff together in the right way, you end up with this representation in f those states that lets you apply unitaries, uh, apply projectors, compute in products, whatever you want to, in polynomial time, or keeping track of phases. This is what we want. Um, and since we can keep track of phases, we can add them up, essentially, and do universal simulation. Uh, so yeah, this is a quick summary of our algorithm that we end up with if you do all this. Uh, so you end up with a classical simulation algorithm for a universal quantum circuit, which has a bunch of controlled phase gates and a bunch of FLO gates. So these controlled phase gates are the non FLO stuff in our circuit. Um, so yeah, circuits which have controlled phase gates and FLO gates are universal. I didn't say that, they are. And then the runtime of our algorithm you can see is, okay, polynomial thing, logarithmic thing, polynomial thing, and the extent. So the extent is the guy which is telling us how not polynomial our uh, simulation is. And it's sort of telling us how magic, if you want to use this, this term, how not classical our computation is. Uh, so this is very nice. Uh, and I, I put this on essentially just to show off. I, I like this slide. It's, yeah. So previously, there was a simulation algorithm written by these guys in Japan. Uh, I think in, in Tokyo somewhere, but I forget the institute. I apologize. Um, so they published this work in 2002. And they have a simulation algorithm for exactly the same setup, so FLO with some control phase gates. Um, but their thing, instead of the extent, scales in some, a quantity they call the fermionic nonlinearity. Um, so every time, um, every time you add a controlled phase gate to our setup, it multiplies your runtime by the extent of that control phase gate. Every time you add a control phase gate to that setup, it multiplies the runtime by the nonlinearity of that control phase gate. And essentially, the nonlinearity is a lot bigger than the extent, so their runtime is dramatically slower than us. Uh, mm -hmm. If you add like a bunch of control Z gates, their runtime gets multiplied by sort of 9 to the K, and ours gets multiplied by 2 to the K. Um, fine. So this is just me showing off. Um, two, 2 is less than 9, so ours is better. Uh, fine. So uh, an, open, an interesting question is, is any of this useful for anything? Uh, for now, this is an open question. I think no one has demonstrated that this is useful for anything yet. I would like to, but no one knows. Um, we can think about a little bit about how it, what, what it would mean for this to be useful. So there's a sort of um, a really obvious classical simulation algorithm for, for like n qubit quantum circuits, which is just you keep track of a state vector of length two to the n, and you update it like whatever in a very simple way. Uh, and this has runtime order two to the n. This is like essentially like the dumb way of classically simulating something. Um, and since our fermionic thing, our fancy fermionic thing, has runtime two to the k where k is the number of non FLO gates, um, or k is, let's say, the number of worst case non FLO gates. This number could be smaller if they weren't all worst case. Uh, we get some advantage over the kind of the naive way if k is less than n. So we can start thinking about quantum circuits where you have fewer non FLO gates than you have qubits. Uh, this is kind of where we would need to be in order to gain some advantage of them. Uh, for Clifford T simulators, this is a little bit better. Uh, so the extent of the worst case single qubit um, non Clifford gates is actually uh, a bit less than 
two. It's two to the 0 0.228. So um, Clifford simulators get an advantage over the mini simulation when roughly k is less than about four n. Um, okay, you can you can cook up examples where they work, but yeah, it's a bit it's a bit strange. Um, you need some strange circuits. I will say that um, yeah. In addition to these uh, straight, in addition to these sort of um, the, this way of thinking about it, uh, we do have an advantage that this way of simulating, this naive way of simulating, takes memory two to the n as well, exponential memory. Um, so if you're, uh, whereas our algorithms require polynomial amounts of memory. So if you are, um, yeah, if you're memory bound, which you might be sometimes, then we have an advantage that's sort of not to do with the time, but to do with the memory. Um, yeah. Sort of intuitively, um, classical simulation of quantum circuits shouldn't require exponential memory. Like X space, this complexity class is really big and, and very bad. Uh, so yeah, polynomial space should be what you need. Um, oh yeah, so another open question is, I mentioned this interesting fact before very quickly, that um, FLO and log space bound quantum circuits are the same. So an FLO circuit is computation equivalent to one which has a logarithmic number of qubits. Um, so this is his result from 2009, which is, what, 15 years ago now. Uh, and I kind of write it like this. Fermion optics is equivalent to log space bound to quantum circuits. Um, what I would like to know is, I've spoken to you today a lot about adding magic to fermion optics. So what happens to the right-hand side of this equation uh, when I add magic states to my FLO? Can I get an equation that's like FLO plus magic equals log space computation plus something natural? Uh, I'm kind of... Vaguely actively thinking about this question. I've thought about it on and off for a few months now. I don't have an answer. What I would love to show, um, what I think is the correct answer, but I don't know how to show it, is that FLO plus magic is computationally equivalent to log space quantum circuits plus some extra qubits. That would make sense. But yeah. Um, I don't know how to prove that. And it's, it's kind of an interesting question. Um, yeah, other interesting questions are about comparing these different sub theories. So I showed you all the way back in my introduction a whole bunch of different. Uh, computational resource theories or kind of free sub theories. And there are a whole bunch of different ways to compare them and contrast them. Um, we don't understand these very well at all. Uh, so essentially, we understand these quantifiers very well, or relatively well in the stabilizer case. So your free sub theory is Clifford uh, stabilizer. We don't really understand anything else at all. Um, so these are, you can essentially just cook up completely arbitrary open questions if you ask any questions about these in the non stabilizer case. Um, and you can also compare these three sub theories beyond simulation. So a fun, a fun fact from this paper from the guys in in Berlin um, last two years ago or last year, I don't remember when it was an archive this thing, is uh, a nice contrast between the stabilizer sub theory and the FLO sub theory. Um, so this this framework of pack learning, probably approximately correct learning, is essentially like I sample a random state, I give it to you, and your job is to work out. Um, Work out which state it was essentially. So you know the probability distribution of something from, but you you want to work out what state it is. And it turns out that um, Clifford stabilized states can be efficiently pack learned, um, but FLO states can't be. So uh, learning uh, FLO states can be hard, whereas learning Clifford stabilized states isn't. I have no idea why. It's kind of cool. And I think I have one minute left, <laughs> so I will finish with an advert. Uh, so this works. So after we put our, our paper in archive, we were contacted by these guys at Quantum Magazine. And they wrote, uh, they spoke to us, they interviewed us, and they wrote a really nice article about it. Uh, so my, my advert is threefold. Firstly, if someone who is not an expert asks you what you learned today, you can point them to this article and they can read it. And it's vaguely understandable. My parents read it, and my parents claim they now understand what I do. So it's it's pretty good. Uh, my sec the second part of my advert is to say, um, yeah, if these guys at Quantum Magazine contact you and they want to write an article about your work, I strongly suggest that you talk to them because they're really good. Um, they spend a lot of time and effort making sure that what they wrote was correct. And they also wrote it in a pretty good way. And I think it, it's like, I have only very positive things to say about working with them. Uh, they let us read an early copy of their, what they're writing. And we, um, you know, we, and they encourage us strongly to point out anything that, that we thought was inaccurate. Uh, so yeah, I, I strongly recommend uh, working with them if you get a chance to. And the third part of that is to say, um, yeah, they, they write really good articles about, so, you know, occasionally I read articles about, I don't know, cosmology or generativity or something, and which I would not understand otherwise. Uh, so it's quite nice to just to read this magazine as well. <laughs> yeah. Uh, so thank you for that. I thank you for your time. <clears throat> and I ask any questions. There's some questions during the talk, but do we have any more? Oscar has a question. Uh, yes, hello. Uh, can you hear me? 
Yeah. But first of all, apologies for not being uh, physically there. I have a very basic question because somehow I missed it. What is the extent? Uh, what's the definition? It is the minimal possible one norm squared of a vector alpha such that there is a decomposition of your vector of your target vector psi in terms of free states with coefficients from this alpha. Um, and the reason you care about this is because of this Hopkins inequality uh, that turns up here. So um, so the extent ends up kind of controlling this parameter n, which in turn controls how many samples you have to take in a sampling algorithm. But yeah, the actual like formal definition is a minimal one norm squared. Uh, yeah. Right, right. Okay. Thank you very much for this nice presentation. Okay, I don't see any questions from the online audience. Uh, yeah. Uh, okay, I have some questions, but it's kind of a basic one. Uh, this operation where you show, like, you have unitary actions or something, and then you can decompose the deep of this matrix R. Yes. Or you can do it like a time up. Is it? Is this operation like transforming one link to the other set, like set, or do you have to find the decomposition for each phase? You mean like equation AC in this thing or something else? Yeah, is there an algorithm that kind of allows you to just find it? Because this is what I'm not kind of following. Whether those parts looking at you, you can say, okay, maybe this is the structure and like you were right in a certain way and this would be arcs, or do you have to actually compute? So it depends how things are given to you. Um, a priori, a unitary u is like an exponentially large object, right? You just give me a list of two to the n squared complex numbers or something. Um, and if you're willing to work in this like exponential space and exponential time world, then yeah, you can you can do this. You can kind of explicitly check whether a unitary is fermionic and find out it's R. Um, but this is a very unnatural thing to do um, because it requires this exponential component just because the unitary is exponentially complex. Um, so a more normal thing is that you will give me R, you'll give me a unitary kind of um, written in terms of fermionic stuff already. Uh, and then you can do things, you can do this efficiently. Okay, that's so, a procedure. Yeah, so th there is a procedure for doing arbitrary unitaries and seeing if they're fermionic and looking for that, but it's really expensive and bad. Just, oh, yeah. I, I, I was asking because like this kind of uh, looks similar to what we do with the tabular formula and yeah. we also have the way of kind of rewriting one to the other mm -hmm. and reducing the, the exponential to the linear. So yeah. this is why I was curious. Yeah, but you can imagine exactly like, um, you know, the stabilizer case. If you give me, if I just give you a random unitary, you get some some numbers, and like, is this a stabilizer? Is this is a clipper unitary. You don't really have no, a good no, no, way no. of checking, I think. Okay. <laughs> so, but if you know it's like yeah. and you know kind of the, what, what is the it's structure, then. Yeah. Okay. So maybe I have a question about this uh, whole concept of uh, fermionic linear optics. Are there any devices which actually implement this? This thing, uh, like literally. Literally, I think no, um, and the reason is that the fermions, which are fermion optics, um, it, it defined in this way, model are spinless, and spinless fermions, as far as I'm aware, don't exist. Mm -hmm. um, fermions has. Well, you can have one component of multi-component yeah. system. If there are no interactions that would flip the spin, then yeah. they are like spinless. Yeah. yeah, yeah. So I, I think you can fake it, but I don't think anyone does. I mean, okay, I guess there would be no reason to because you can officially fastly simulate it, right? So why would you bother quantum computer on something you can simulate yeah. right. efficiently? Um, yeah. Okay. Mm -hmm. so I don't see more questions. So let's uh, thank Oli once again.